it's the way they really are in some ways, you know, they're toxic poisons. But I also, I looked at these foods like I'm not going to entertain these greedy, selfish, horrible people that make this food so available to everybody. So I, I look at food entirely different. I've kind of reprogrammed my brain even to this day. Uh, the, when I look at foods like, say, a pack of Maltesers or even a loaf of bread, I look at that and I think that stuff's evil. I'm, I'm worth more than that, you know, self-worth, self-love and, and stay mentally stable and, and strong. And that, for me, got me through to where I would say is about four months where, you know, obviously fat adapted, obviously great results, but no cravings after four months. I had zero cravings. And so now I'm in the position where I look at that stuff and I don't really have to go, oh, that's evil. It just doesn't make sense to me anymore. Um, and and it's, it's no real struggle. There's no real struggle with it at all. And so I think, you know, hard work pays off. And I think obviously it can be hard work for some. I definitely had some incentive after three weeks. But as I kept improving and improving to the point where I had no cravings, it becomes effortless. And um, I'm very happy to eat steak every day i always try and eat red meat every day when i'm hungry and that's what i think about and um i could not say you know better things about this this diet this way of life so for me um it's easy mode now life is on easy mode right now yeah for sure i'm, I'm sure a lot of the other guys can relate to that um perhaps we'll go through around um clockwise today so we'll just ask phil what his um experience has been so maybe what got you motivated to start what's kept you accountable since because i know we've we've all, all of us ever ever on this panel you know we spoke about um, what we're gonna eat at christmas time and we're gonna be strict or not strict or medium strict <laughs> the chances are we probably weren't that strict you know um so what what is it feel that keeps you accountable despite having that like odd beer every now and then or something which just doesn't sit right with your body i can't do the odd beer that's just mashed grains that's gonna hurt <laughs> <laughs> I, I I agree with Lee. I think that you know at the beginning you you, you have to have some sort of uh, motivation or tricks. For me, it was um, if I was craving something, it was uh, it was my gut bacteria craving it and not me. So uh, I would always tell myself that you know when I went went to fill up the car or whatever and walk past the rows of chocolate. But now it's been so long, you know, it's been so many years that the same as Lee, I just look at it and it's not something that's edible. But my motivation was crippling agony <laughs> to get started. And Ben often says that he envies me that I was in that much pain. I, I don't think he does really, but I know what he means that, you know, his motives are not really that powerful. But for me, it was once I discovered that that really was the answer to get out of that horrific agony of psoriatic arthritis, that, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it really, was all I needed for motivation. But I see it with clients if I do consults. And if you get somebody with really painful arthritis, they're very often the most motivated and they do the best, you know, better often than people with MS. It's more difficult for them to keep on the path because it isn't so immediately agonizing or a thyroid issue or something like that. So, yeah, the, the, the motivation isn't there, but, you know, the, the, the pain can get so horrific with, with arthritis that, um, yeah, it, 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 uh, it keeps you on the straight and narrow. It really does. But it's the same as anybody. I did fall off the wagon. Well, only to the extent of, you know, milk, uh, well, not milk, but uh, some dairy, some chicken, pork and eggs, uh, summer before last. Um, too regularly and it, it really really bit me in the ass and it was proper agony again I pushed it too much when I didn't think I needed to <laughs> but so yeah it's lamb beef salt and water for me and I'm fine when I do that so I stay with that but um, yeah there's a lot of other aspects to the whole psychology of it I mean one side of it is coming from a sort of yogi background and being um, you know eating Indian food basically <laughs> Indian veggie food for 30 odd years and and uh, as well as other crap but that's what I thought was my healthy part of my diet and getting brainwashed into that so you know that's a, another avenue we might go down because people have said to me oh you're one of the only people who combines carnivore with spirituality and just to say that there's nothing unspiritual about it whatsoever really and we were conned into that all along so there are a lot of um a lot, a lot of psychological aspects to it. How about you, Stephen? 
Oh, hello. <laughs> that hello. was a very quick. That was a very quick segue. Um, I think my journey is very different to to everyone else's. I think Jonathan's di journey is different to mine. Uh, just to make it a bit broader, I mean, the psychology of nutrition depends on on what your issues are. So it could be emotional eating, so that sort of thing. Uh, I, situational eating is underestimated, and I always use the story that uh, never in my life have I ever been anywhere and thought I really need a hot dog and a and a big can of coke or a big bucket of coke unless I'm in the cinema right that's conditioning that is just dealing with your emotions and it's nothing to do with hunger whatsoever but I think you know to, although that sounds a bit facetious that is that is a real thing for me that uh, when I first started eating this way I was surprised at how I'd been programmed you know we're not going to talk red pill tonight but I was. I was programmed to go to the cinema. Well, why do you eat even, you know, what? why do you even do that in the first place? You know, I never think I'm going to watch a film over Christmas. I must stuff my face while I do that, you know. Um, yeah, do you know, I, I know, I know exactly what you mean. For me, it was minstrels and cancer in a can, which is Pringles, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, Mad. But, going, but going back, I suppose, to me, you in my 40s, I had been or should have been the poster boy for the guidelines. Right now, I know we're going off psychology a little bit, but we'll come back to it. Um, I guarantee. And, you know, I, I didn't eat anything bad. And I was a personal trainer and I was a, you know, a damn good one. I got somebody to the Olympics. I got somebody in the top 20% of the world marathon running from being four stone overweight and, and a smoker. Right. So there you go. That guy had a problem because he couldn't give up smoking, but he did because he found something else to replace that hit, that dopamine hit, that cuddle in a you know a stick of uh, tobacco, was losing the weight and being productive. So the personal training side of things, and this is where it comes becomes pertinent to tonight's subject. The 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 girl I got into the Olympics wasn't was not it was not me. I was just the guide. And we did a lot of things like visualization, seeing what you're going to do, you know, talk yourself into doing a positive throw and all that. So the mind body connection, which people still think is not really true, is, it, it definitely is. You know, if someone goes out onto the soccer field and says, today I'm going to have a, a stinker, they're probably going to because they're not in the right frame of mind. And I don't think you'd have to be, you know, having a degree in psychology to think, yeah, that, that, that's probably going to be a bad game for that player. It's pretty obvious. So anyway, through my 40s, I found that I was questioning everything because I was doing everything right, but getting the wrong result. You know, if someone says you're going to do X, Y, Z, like Phil was saying about, you know, being a vegan, and you've read everywhere and you've seen game changers, and it doesn't happen, you blame yourself. You think you're doing it wrong. You see, and the, the, this is perception. So that's another psychology. It's your perception that you are doing wrong because if the outside influences are saturating you with misinformation. So you have to then get that cognitive ability. So I'm trying to trying to do all the keywords for everybody who's interested in psychology and seeing the uh, thumbnail. And you've got to make the thoughts for yourself. You've got to realize, hey this isn't working for me. And then you get into the isolation where you think it's only you because all these other vegans are doing really well or whatever. All right. So I was thinking, well, I'm a personal trainer and all the other personal trainers seem to be doing all right, but I'm getting a bit tubbier and I'm getting lower left quadrant pain and my coronary artery calcium scan is, is atrocious. What am I doing wrong? But then when you start to talk to these people, you realize you're not the only one. And, and there were other personal trainers saying, this is really tough and I'm not getting the results I thought I'd get. And, blaming the clients you know they're obviously not complying they're not adhering to the diet all rubbish of course so you then take it into your own realm you know so lee had a very you know uh physical manifestation of what was what was wrong with the diet and so do you feel well i did but it wasn't as extreme but there was a lot of it so like the lower left quadrant pain, I totally believed in the genetic link between my mum dying of colon cancer, my dad dying of cancer, both, you know, relatively young. And I just thought, that's it. <laughs> I am also going to die at 50 or before. 
now realizing, of course, that's all rubbish because I, I the only thing I inherited from my parents was eating the wrong things, which was which was allegedly the right things. So I had to take it onto myself and go forward with my own views, which in this day and age we need to do more and more because we're, we're literally told how to think all the time in the newspapers, the TV. I mean, I don't actually buy a newspaper. I don't watch a TV. I don't have a lot of TV license. It's, it's all crap. And the moment you take yourself out of that and you start to use your brain and use your cognitive ability to, to work out what's going on, you find out that actually nutrition is, is the key to many things. So paint your perception of pain, your the amount of healing time that's needed if you have an injury, if you get sick. I mean, that's that's the other thing. If you get sick, I mean, I haven't been sick since I've done low carb, which is so 10 years I haven't been to the doctor. Well, I was a miserable creature every single winter when I was high carb and a, a advanced personal trainer and doing all the right things. Every single year I had sniffles and I was on antibiotics for this and that and, you know, not sleeping properly. So um i've forgotten what the question is but the answer is <laughs> carnival or eating meat not eating carbohydrates and i think just thinking for yourself and you, you just become more mindful you find things that are difficult like you know cravings they become easier so the eating disorders again just going back to psychology i think there's less and less eating disorders in this community than in any other community or, or way of eating i don't find many carnivores saying i oh, just couldn't stop eating ribeyes you know every single night I'm and that's not because it's not tasty or because it's not enjoyable it's because it's very filling and it's not full of stuff that's going to make you want everything else and eat lots of stuff or um you know i don't want to get too into the weeds with it but you won't have an eating disorder if you're eating the right foods. It's only if you've got the wrong perception of yourself, you're you're thinking you're doing the wrong thing because things aren't working for you or everyone else is telling you that you should do, or if you're malnourished. So if you're nourished, satiated, you are going to feel less likely to want to sort of binge and go after foods that really are, are, are doing nothing for you other than giving you maybe a quick dopamine hit. But, um, yeah, I won't go on too long. But I think it's a really big subject. I think it's really interesting how many boxes it ticks because it just makes all the things in the in the realm of psychology much easier. Everything, cognitive function, uh, controlling your eating, controlling your mood, controlling your emotions. It's, it's, it's all there. And I think a lot of the problems of modern society, without being too sort of um, highfalutin, is down to diet. I think a lot of anxiety and ADHD and all this sort of stuff is is the wrong diet. It really is that simple. I just don't see it in carnival. I don't have coach clients that say to me, I can't stop eating eggs. You know, I'm, I'm, cra I'm craving bacon. It's just... They just eat. They sleep better and they're happier. It's really quite simple. I might need a question directed at me because I forgot what my own question was. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, can you remember what, what I was on about? I can't remember. <laughs> my brain's um, I'm running on like 30% at the moment. So I can't, can't remember anything. I'm old and I've got a chemo deficiency. I can't That's remember the one, anything. yeah. A bit, bit of scurvy <laughs> as well. <laughs> a lot uh, of that. I, I, I get. I guess maybe this doesn't link to the question at hand, but um, I don't know. But I had an experience recently where I had what um you might call just just a dream. So I just had a very long daydream for a couple of hours. Um, and you know, in that experience, I felt like I was kind of floating in midair, but I felt safe. It was almost like I was somewhere, but I was actually not anywhere. I wasn't actually on a map or some sort of in the physical presence. I was basically like a spirit, you might say. Um, and I was looking around me, and I saw these like red tentacles going around me, um, and they had like blue kind of lines around them, like, kind, of, kind of like floral tentacles. It's not scary, very um, comedic, almost seemed funny. You know, it's quite odd. Um, anyway, what was happening was I was like moving towards these things, trying to work out what was going on, and I felt like I was breathing underwater. So I essentially thought. 
am I a fish or something? What's going on? Why am I breathing this this odd way? It's like I couldn't. Like I I feel like I could breathe, but it felt like a different kind of breathing. Um, not pleasant, but not nasty either. Um, anyway, I started to move close towards these tentacles, and I started to like touch them. Remember, I couldn't see my hand. It, I just I felt my my spirit was like touching them. Um, and anyway, what happened was, as soon as I touched them, I felt all the pain I've experienced in my life in in one split second. I was like, it, it shocks you. It's like it sends like um your spirit back was like your soul is moving away from your your body sort of thing. Um, Anyway, I did it again, but then I started to enjoy doing it, not because I enjoyed the pain, but I enjoyed the fact that my default was that I wasn't in pain because I was touching something. I had control over whether that pain was affecting me or not. Then I basically linked that daydream that I had with an experience I had about two, maybe one to two months before my spinal infusion surgery, and that was when I thought, okay, this is the date that I'm going to have my spine infused. This is the date where I'm going to have the only solution to my spine problem um that could possibly fix it um anyway so i obviously had a lot of faith in it because you know when you've had different procedures spent thousands of different therapy supplements treatments then every diet in the book and you find no relief you think well if that's not worked this one thing which is the biggest intervention i could possibly have will do the job it should hit the nail on the head um then for about let's say for the rest of that period before my surgery it's almost as if i had maybe a third less pain so it felt more bearable like i could not do more in a day but my day-to-day -day subjective experience was as in less pain um so i basically linked those two things together and now I'm, my motivation is a little bit different um it's not so much that i'm thinking that i'm following the carnivore diet to you know reduce inflammation you know i've done all this i've got the blood test to prove it um i'm as healthy as i probably could be right now outside of being probably too lean for what i'm meant to be doing um but saying that it's like i feel that i'm i'm stronger from being from achieving the things i have but not because i've achieved my ultimate goal which is to not be in pain it's because i've achieved micro goals so i've set short-term objectives in that time so you know most people that follow this way of eating will notice pretty much immediate or very you know near proximity in terms of like length of time um an improvement in symptoms of digestive issues so if they're bloated from meals, they're eating half the mass of food that they were before because they're not eating watermelons and giant broccoli heads and things. So that's usually the first thing. The other things might be a bit more energy. Maybe the mood might improve over time. Um, some things take longer, maybe inflammation. You know, if you've got some sort of heart issue, your blood's not pumping around properly, maybe that might take a bit longer. Um, but all these like, things start to check box. And I didn't, I didn't have all those problems, granted, but um, I did have mostly mental manifestations of illness so that is where my experience has come from so a lot of my benefit has been from the carnival diet on my mental health so uh, my psychology basically and now given the fact i know that i've tick boxed so many of those things so all these things which were previously maybe three out of ten ten being great perfect health zero being you know dead um, i'm now not a three out of ten overall in terms of my my health i would sample about six um, so I'm actually living a better life now. So that keeps me motivated to carry on with the carnival diet because I know it's it's held on to so many of those boxes. So then the next jump in my my health endeavors to feel more energetic or you know manage myself a bit better, I don't know, try and be more friendly to people at times selectively. Um that becomes a more achievable goal because I've achieved the other things so far. So for me, it's been a case of pinpointing small achievable goals. That work towards a bigger goal. Um, so that's my take on psychology on the carnivore diet. It might not make much sense, but that's been, been it really. Um, did anyone else have anything else to add about that at all? Did I inspire any provocative thoughts? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting that you're going into those realms. You know, you're talking about that daydream, which is kind of probably unexpected to people listening in on this, but it's funny because, you know, when vegans and whatever say that we're just, um, you know, aggressive cavemen and with no spirituality and that kind of thing. And I found it to be quite the opposite because you're really spaced out and your brain's malnourished as a vegan. You can think that you're in some sort of higher state of consciousness when you're not. You're just probably malnourished. <laughs> and I've had that. 
where people go, oh, I'm so spaced out today, isn't it wonderful? And and I've had times where I'm wandering around thinking that. But then as I got sicker and and, and I started paying attention to what was probably really going on, I, I realized that, no, I, I just I, I didn't really know what I was because where I was or whatever, because I was um, so brain fogged and probably bordering on Alzheimer's or something. And this is what happens when it's like a f- good friend of mine who's been on my podcast. Chris B, he calls himself on my podcast, but he he grew up in that whole spiritual tradition of Muktananda and, you know, some Indian guru and his parents were into him. And he said a great thing. And he's still a very spiritual guy and a carnival. And he said, you know, were those gurus enlightened or were they just malnourished? <laughs> and, and I think that's an interesting one because I had, um, before I did the Red Pill Buddhist podcast, I had one called Carnivore and Beyond that's still available. It's only 10 episodes, but I picked people who were very spiritual people, some guy, people like spiritual teachers or whatever, and people who had destroyed their health with veganism and their their mental health and even their spiritual um, <clears throat> perception and, and even in some cases what they classed as awakenings they'd lost because they got so ill. And these were people who'd reintroduced meat or gone fully carnivore or whatever, pretty close, and had got back that spiritual perception. And I, I think that's important that, you know, people often go to these plant based diets because they think that it's more spiritual. And I don't think it is. You know, if you get into the whole chakra system and people say, oh, I'm in my higher chakras and whatever. I mean, what 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 is the top floor of a house without the foundations? It's useless. So what's wrong with a lower chakra? You know, it, it, it's it's it grounds you, and and eating properly will open that up. Whereas you know, eating rice and dal and meditating all day will leave you with no foundation. Um, so I think I think that a lot of the, um, you know, say we're not going to get red pill, but I'll go a little bit. That that you know, a lot of the um, uh, uh, spiritual communities have kind of been set up to. Um, to get you to, to get you less in touch with yourself. You know, we've dealt with this in our Red Pill Revolution and Red Pill Food Revolution books of what's happened here and how we've been controlled so long with these um, these plant-based diets and, and pretending that they're spiritual. And, you know, even the, even the idea that some of these gurus were actually put in place by the CIA. <laughs> I think... That's interesting when we're all following them in the 70s and 80s and going, oh, we're all so spiritual. We're following this amazing Indian dude. And it's it, so much of the bullshit has come from that whole religious and spiritual thing. And I think that affects the whole psychology of it sometimes when some people won't go carnival, they won't do it when they realize they've already got issues mentally, psychologically, emotionally. And they won't do it because some dude in a in a you know, in a loincloth or whatever, told them or some rope, <laughs> told them that it's really not, you know, it's t- tremendously unspiritual. Uh, and, and this is a, a really important thing to get across, I think, to people, because I think a lot of people fail to go into their healing because they consider themselves spiritual. And then, you know, and they also do this whole spiritual bypassing thing. I am, right, I'm really spiritual, so I don't need to do any emotional work. I mean, a lot of the emotional work I did, like the, EFT and tapping and stuff that I get through. It's in my arthritis, the best thing that ever happened to me. But the, th- the third third is all the woo woo stuff, you know, it's not the diet stuff or anything. And working on that emotional stuff. I remember somebody first suggested it and said, Have you ever tried any of this stuff? A friend of mine. And I'm like, Well, I'm a great yogi. I don't need to do any of that. That's just for like housewives and stuff. And I was so arrogant, you know, it, I needed that's exactly what I needed. And so, you know, all of the side of it is people who talk about health as just the diet. I think it's really nice about this tonight because, you know, it does help everything. It, it does. It does help to balance the emotions. When you see people, you know, in my carnival group on Facebook and, and, and I see people who say, yeah, I was vegan. I can't believe how I look back and how emotionally unstable I was and how you know, I was so easily upset and offended and aggressive. But I didn't realize it at the time, had no idea at the time. So it's very difficult to dig out of that hole. But once you do start running on fats and not carbs, everything smooths out. Like Stephen says, the answer is carnivore. Yeah. Brilliant. Cheers, Fat Phil. Um, I'm going to get to the questions now. Um, try and keep them psychology specific because this is a psychology Q&A. 
So the idea is we can answer people's questions all related to that in one swoop. Um, this just from a subscriber, Mauro. Hello from Oxfordshire. As per me, sometimes not having the actual need to go carnivore is the biggest obstacle because you feel like a small cheat won't be that impacting. Yes, I meet lots of young people who are, you know, in their early 20s and they want to get fit and muscular and they're like, oh, I, was, I don't really stick to it that much. Well, wait until you get to, um, well, a bit older. Well, I wouldn't say my age, but you get to Phil's age and you've got box weights <laughs> coming out your backside, you know? <laughs> So you've uh, got all that to look forward to, but yeah, your, your needs definitely defines how how firm your objectives are for sure. Um, can I can I say something on that, Jonathan? Before you move on, yeah. because the word, the word cheat, right? If you're a hundred meter sprinter and you cheat, you're you're hoping that you will win because you cheat. A cheat meal is not going to do that. It's going to sabotage you. So you know, if you want to keep it psychology sort of specific. You've got to look at how you speak about things as well and the words that you're using. A cheat meal is not that. A cheat meal is a sabotage meal. And if you think it's a treat, that's the wrong thing as well. Because if you if you take the human out of it, if you've got a pet, for instance, that you think is wonderful, would you have a bag of treats that you knew would make that pet ill? No, you wouldn't. You want to give that treat that dog, that cat, whatever, the treat that's going to make them feel great. So you wouldn't do it. So you shouldn't treat yourself worse than you would treat your pet. And you've got to put yourself in front of the queue and not believe all this stuff. Again, it's going into advertising. Oh, you know, I've had people, you know, on the personal training side of things, oh, I went to the gym and then I had, you know, a Snickers bar as a reward. I'm like, at what point is that a reward? You've actually just undone all the work in the gym rather than reward yourself, a reward is actually going and saying, right, I'm being super fit tonight, and I'm sticking to it. And then you'll wake up in the morning, you will feel better. And I think that's the way we look at these words and these things it is, is vitally important to how we get on with this. Because, you know, if I said, um, hey, guys, just before I came on, I gave myself a real big treat. I, you know, I had a big bowl of rice. And uh, I had loads of veg on it. It was, it was really good. And then I had a Coca-Cola. You'd be like, what, what are you doing, Stephen? That's, that's rubbish. You would. You would just simply say that. It's just not a reward in any way, shape, or form. So uh, sorry to get, to get heavy on that one word, but it, it it's endemic, isn't it, to do these things. Oh, I, I went off carnival at the weekend. Now, I live in the real world, okay, uh, and I've got a client that has to go out and sort of do a lot of schmoozing with his bosses and stuff like that. And if he doesn't do that, then he's not one of the team, which is, you see, it's a sad indictment of society that the only way is it's not about merit. It's about, you know, fitting in. And he feels that if he doesn't fit in, then he's not going to climb up the greasy pole. Well, that's the reason. It's not really an excuse. It depends how confident you are and how important your health is. But, if it's keeping a roof over your head and stopping your wife leaving you because you can't pay the mortgage or whatever, getting the kids to school and feeding them, then take it on the chin and do it. So I do live in the real world. I know there are examples where people are not eating carnivore and it, it, there are real reasons, but I just think things like the cheat, a cheat meal is, is not fitting that remit. It's just, I'm having a but cheat meal. Word, balance. I think, <laughs> balance. I, I think that's, that's that's really, yeah, that's really spot on, Steve. Exactly on the cheap thing. Just, just before I make mean, one second here, but Steve popped up after I mentioned the EFT thing, the emotional freedom technique, and he says that the, but the Sedona method took me so much further. And yeah, Steve, Sedona method is great. There's a few methods out there, and there's Byron Katie's stuff as well. And whatever you use, I think it's fantastic. Some people like one thing more than another, but all of these things can be really, really helpful. And People kind of ignore it because they think it's all about meat and it's not all about meat. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> no, no, that's no, all good. That's no, all good. <laughs> it's getting the right balance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I call them off-plan meals myself just because I do eat to a plan. Um, if I if I didn't deliberately, if I just go and went about my day and like feel or you guys just had like I'm gonna have this much, this, this much, that just guess, guess it, just give my feel. Then yeah, I'd probably just say I've I've, I've been off the diet. That's pretty much all I'd say. Um, but I just I, I specify off plan because I have a plan 
because my diet is to reach an objective. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we got one question here. Be a fast or something, isn't it? Really? Cheat day, yeah. A day, a day yeah, of not, not eating. worried about eating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've not got many questions tonight, guys. But I found um, these twenty, but this one's from Near Zero. I have AFib. Have had four ablations over the last seven years. I'm head of my fifth. I'm losing weight, but very slowly. Do any of you have any advice for such as I? Um, I've got some ideas, but about, I've got a few ideas. What do you think, Stephen? Well, no, you go, you go for your ideas because I I actually asked near near zero a follow up question, but I don't know if he's answered. Well, what's your ideas? My ideas. Um, well, I'd probably lose weight very slowly. I don't see the benefit of dislodging calcified plaque fast because um, that can just cause damages to the endothelial layer anyway. Um, so I'd advise, it depends obviously how much weight they had to lose. If it's, say, seven years, that we're looking at maybe doing it over like 150 pounds over about seven years. That's a very safe way of doing it. Um, the other thing I'd probably look at is some exercise, but not too much, just based on what you can achieve. Um, that sort of targets your main muscle groups. I think a lot of people just lose loads of weight, but they don't. Their, their body almost holds sometimes less muscle for it because they're not carrying as much around with them. So imagine if I was just to eat a standard Western diet and just eat pizza and chocolate all day, I'm just gain a load of weight and not exercise. Um, I'd probably maintain quite a bit of my muscle mass, to be fair, just because we're carrying around more weight. Now, it wouldn't be loads more, but it'd be somewhat more. Um, so if this person lost, say, 150 pounds in my example over seven years um then they need to find a way to keep the metabolic rate up so when they actually lose that weight they've got some metabolic metabolically active tissue to help with autophagy um because the more metabolically active tissue you have through muscle mass the more autophagy you can produce so for me a one day fast is like another person doing two days of fasting um it, it does work that way it's based on your your muscular mass your metabolic metabolically active tissue um that's two ways. The other way would be probably supplementing with a high quality vitamin E oil or tablet, um, help with the oxidation of fat. Other things might include taurine just to help protect the heart. Um, also help decrease the size of the left ventricle, ventricle, which will happen if you're a heavy body weight, regardless if you're muscular or fat, it'll still get bigger. Um, what are the other ones? Probably vitamin K2 supplementation. Or having some chicken thighs, something with, you know, raw milk with some K2 in it if you tolerate it, stuff like that. Um, that's probably my guess, guesswork, if I was to pick a few things I'd look at. Um, but what do, you, what do you do, Stephen? Well, sorry if I'm being thick here, but I, I don't even know if losing weight is a good thing or a bad thing. If this, Do you know this person? Are they actually try, actively trying to lose weight or is losing weight part of a symptom? That's, She's that pretty healthy. All right. Okay. She's, so she, I, don't, I don't think she, she's ever overweight or anything. No. So, so that would be a thing that you could flag up and say: Are you losing weight in a good way? Are you losing body fat, or are you losing muscle and or bone? Anyway, uh, you know, if you look at AFib, well, what is AFib, and what is the ablations doing? Well, the ablations is trying to get rid of tissue that's obstructing the electrical pathways, basically. So. There could be things that you're doing which are really quite simple, like caffeine, for instance, can trigger AFib. Anything sort of stressy or, um, you know, an overstimulation of some type. So we're talking about stimulants such as caffeine. Uh, are you sleeping? There's, there's, there's too many things to ask, really, to do it as a broad answer on YouTube. But my advice would be to try and look at the things that uh, can cause AFib rather than getting rid of the uh, mechanical symptoms. Because obviously, if you've had four of these over seven years, it's not working because it's, it's you're getting rid of obstructions, but you're not stopping the root cause, which is AFib. You wouldn't need the ablations if you didn't have AFib. So what's causing that? And I think that's a big thing in this space. And everybody on this screen probably really preaches this that it, it's not about putting a band-aid over a problem. It's, well, what is causing the problem? Let's let's get to the nitty-gritty. Because if you didn't have AFib, you wouldn't be having ablations. As simple as that. It really is that simple. So you've got to go through all the things like, are you, you know, are you sleeping okay? Um, what's your blood pressure like? And the reason I wanted to, I think I flagged up that there's somebody asked about blood pressure. 
Um, you know, you've you've got to look at all of the, all of these things. Can I just share a screen a second, Jonathan? Because somebody said what their blood pressure was, and um, uh, I just wanted to show you a chart from a medical book that isn't sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and it's actually a proper medical book rather than something trying to sell you stuff. So um, this one twenty over eighty for your blood pressure is. Uh, BS really, because it's only applicable to like a 19 year old male or female. Um, and even then you can still, well, 2024, 20, maybe 120 over 79 or one. Yeah. So um, this is age related. So your arteries, they stiffen over time. So you should have slightly higher blood pressure as you get older. 120 over 80 was bought in and magically all insurance premiums could go up for many, many people. It's not a medical number. It is an arbitrary. It is an arbitrary figure that they've arrived at. So as you get older, as you can see, you know, normal blood pressure one thirty four over eighty seven. The difference between the top and bottom number is actually more important. You need to. It's called pulse pressure, and the difference needs to be about forty on average. Um, it's more troublesome if, say, for instance, your blood pressure was one twenty over sixty. That would be really difficult to um, diagnose, but you'd need to get into that because that's a, like a circulation problem or there's some, something wrong with the returning volume of the blood. But anyway, um, so when, you, when you're told 120 over 80, uh, that isn't really a medical thing. You could look that up. That's easy to find. You just just have to look up age related blood pressure re uh, readings. So yeah, one of one of your people put a, a a mark on there and said that their blood pressure is going up. Well, that is a worry. You, you, a trend of your blood pressure going up. You, yeah, you've got to look at that. But um, don't spend your entire life trying to get it to one twenty over eighty. Try to get it more age appropriate and understand that it's a mechanism and dynamic. So you could take it in the morning, you could take it in the afternoon, you could take it in the evening, it would be different. You could take it at the doctor's office where you're a bit more stressed and um, it would be different. You could take your uh, two and a half litres of water and drink as much as you possibly can and, and, and take your blood pressure before you drink the water and then afterwards and see your blood pressure go up because you're drinking water, too much of it. So um, it's, it's a bit more nuanced. So, yeah, going back to the AFib question, uh, the reason I'm tying that in is because one of the causes of AFib can be blood pressure or hypertension. Um, so, yeah, lots of lots of questions, more questions than answers from that particular post, I think. Um, Lee or Phil, do you have a take on that question at all before I move on? Um, I mean, what I would add is perhaps just to to try and optimize things beyond diet so because it's all electrical perhaps maybe grounding a lot would help maybe proper circadian rhythm she's mentioned that her sleep is still an issue if you were to set your alarm if you just check on your phone while it's light <laughs> check on your phone what time the sun is going to rise and then just set your alarm and, and try and get yourself into a rhythm get yourself outside some cold exposure you know just go out as you are straight outside ground your feet and just chill and just take in the light as it as it changes and the sun comes up, all of this stuff, if you start practicing this daily, you, you might find that you can have at least better sleep, but it's, it's you're, you're really, you know, asking for a better an electrical system and, and it goes way beyond diet. You could eat all of the perfect foods in the world if you're doing a night shift and you're not sleeping properly and you never ground, you never see the sun, it might not do all that much for you. You know, I think for some people, um, we need to do everything, uh, go above and beyond. So, it's something that I'm going to try and start doing a little bit more. Um, you know, I do, I do do it pretty regularly and I'm quite strict, but to kind of get up so that I can be there right at the beginning while the sun's coming up ground and, and maybe cold exposure, all of these things are really, really healthy. That's what we're designed to do. We're, des we're, not, we're not designed to be stuck inside, out away from the sun, nothing but blue light, cardigans adapted to the warm. That That's terrible for health. So we should try and just look at it like, what is our natural lifestyle and diet? And in the modern world, it's very, very difficult. But I think it's something actually that when you were talking about, Phil, earlier on with, you know, kind of a spiritual side of things, the way for me things have gone is that I just have a greater appreciation for life, mostly pertaining to nature. I love the birds. I used to hate the birds. Kind of leave me alone. I want to lay in. Now the birds are a sign that 
is another day we got to get up and you know take in the light let's be a part of nature i appreciate nature more and i think you know even the animals yes to all the vegans yes i, I really appreciate and love animals i love it all you know the sky the sun setting the cold the hot the weather the rain it's all beautiful and i have a greater appreciation uh, for that stuff and uh, you know i experience more calm with that stuff and i think when you're one with nature as well it's very peaceful you know it might seem harsh at first to get up and you're cold and you don't really want to get out of bed but there's a lot of calm that you experience from that you take a moment to yourself and you just take yourself outside you find your thoughts they're um they're calming they're not sort of stressful thoughts you're not a lot worried you know it's, it's it's strange but if you wake up late you're going to be stressed you're you're in a rush you're in a hurry the sun's been up you've missed your window your circadian's going to be out of whack you're out of whack you know so I would encourage to look beyond the diet. You know, obviously high fat carnivore is the way to go. Red meat exclusively is probably the best for the most extreme issues that people suffer with. But to optimize life and and lifestyle, everything that you practice beyond diet may be that kind of extra 10% that you need. Maybe that will help because it's all electrical. It's going to help perhaps fix some issues. Who knows? I couldn't have put it better than Lee. Spot on everything. I might make a clip out of that, Lee. That was um, excellent. It was really it good. Is, yeah. it's, 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 it's English as well, and I think anyone would understand that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not very well, well read. So there, you go. <laughs> there we go. Um, get to the the question here about blood panels. Um, be a brief one. Um, can you suggest a good provider to have blood panels done? Um, I'll say who I use, so they might be good. Seems to be better than the other ones I've used. Um, Medichex, if you're from the UK, um, that's the one I use. But um, uh, actually, Stephen, what ones do you use, or would you refer people to? Well, when I when I did my private blood test uh, clinic, I used Medichex. I think they're very good, but they have quite big holes in what they will and won't do. They don't do a cystatin C test, for instance. Um, if you are looking to do sort of things like your um, gut microbiome there's a uh, neo voss i think it's called um people can email me and i'll send you a link which is in the uk which is why i asked if you're in the uk or not because if you're outside of the uk i need to know where you are before i can answer um so i have a lot of people ask me about bloods all over the all over the world because that's one of the things I do a lot of. So, uh, but in the UK, you know, Medichex is very good. If you're having trouble, email me if there's a particular test, because some of the labs will do a particular test, but they'll do it sort of off label, so to speak. Um, the Cystatin C, for instance, I'm looking at a lab that is not currently doing it, but saying to me that if I can get a batch run done, they will start doing it. So, um, people power. Uh, the reason the Cystatin C test is not popular is because, um, the kidney panel that is offered in the mainstream is is shown to be very much lacking if you have a cystatin C test. And you can have a filtration rate of your kidney that is subpar, so, you know, under 60, and people think you need some kidney treatment. You have a cystatin C test, which is a proper test about your kidney function, and you get a, re a reading of maybe 114, 120. Uh, so it makes a mockery of all those other test that you've had you see so um anyway she's in the uk that person or that person is in the uk i don't know if it's a female or male but um yeah many checks for 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 the main is pretty good lee and phil do you guys use any blood panels or do you refer to uh, someone else go with coach stephen <laughs> nothing to add yeah, there exactly. really I, I, I... <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I mean, I, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but nobody else is going to. So uh, if you want them interpreted as well, then you can email me and book me in and I'll go through them with you. I was about to blow your trumpet, actually, yeah, Stephen. Yeah, I vouch, I vouch. Because, <laughs> you know, that that um, that talk that you gave at our War on Health event a couple of weekends ago, amazing, really eye-opening, really <laughs> useful I think it blew up a load of crap for people and people loved it. So thank you very much again. And well done. I mean, it, it, it blew me away. It was just uh, perfectly uh, describing why you know, there are so many myths around it and these things are interpreted wrong. So yeah, if you, wherever you get blood tests done, 
give Stephen a, 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 a nudge and get him to interpret them because you'll <laughs> you'll have a far better idea than the fear mongering uh, drug peddlers. Thank you. Oh, look, there's a sure. question. Any advice for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? I've got no idea about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wrote a book about it, didn't they? <laughs> oh, but it's, it might have been me. I've, I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't trust him, though. He used to be a vegan, this, guy, this geezer. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that got me into trouble in the first place, so I had to dig myself out of that hole. Um, oh, we do. We do that one. Okay. I'll do that then. Um, any advice for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Yes, absolutely. I had it. I didn't have so much psoriasis, but had incredibly severe psoriatic arthritis. And um, yes, it is a carnivore diet. It's a very high fat beef, lamb, salt and water. Get your circadian rhythms right, everything else right. But on a dietary level, don't mess about. Don't mess about with any plants, any funny supplements, nothing. You've got to heal the gut. And you don't have um, dairy, eggs, pork or chicken either. Just don't make all the mistakes I did and end up with some joint damage. Get rid of it as quick as possible and um, just go high fat. It's, it, it can say it in two seconds, but, you know, explaining why is, is, is the difficult one. That takes me, you know, 90 minutes or so on a, on a consult. If, you, if, you really, if you're in real trouble and you really want to be set on the right path, I don't often say that this on on these GB carnivores things, but hit me up for a proper consult because there are real subtle tweaks that will make the difference between success and failure on that. And um, yeah, and the psoriasis side, the skin thing, it can, it, you need patience and it can actually go on longer even than the, the joint issues as, as you unwind it. An analogy I often use is that um, if you turn the engines off on a ferry or a big ship, it doesn't stop immediately. It carries on for a bit. The body's doing what it needs to do to clear whatever it is it's needing to do. But the engines have been turned off. Once the gut's healed, then you're going to you're going to be okay in time, and don't get demoralised and discouraged. But um, absolutely, you've got to you've got to heal the gut. But really, I sound dogmatic, but the only way to really be sure of doing that is. Fatty beef, lamb, salt, and water. And when I say fatty, it's that sort of PKD, paleo medicinal ratio, one third fat to two thirds lean meat on the plate around that area. Very high fat. Uh, you, 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 you will even maybe have trouble if you're not eating enough fat and you're eating beef and lamb only. So it, it's a real balance. And it, if you get it right, yeah, PKD, you get that right. And it, and it will sort itself out. Absolutely. It will. Very nice. Um, we've got one more question for tonight. Um, this one's about nootropics like powdered lion's mane. Has anyone used these sort of things? I, I've, I'll give yep. quite a long answer to this one. So I'll give, give you guys the floor first. Well, I tried, I tried alpha brain and I do think it helped actually. I did it when I was doing my honours degree, the honours part of my science degree. Now, this is where you get confounders because I was also doing um, carnivore and also doing stem enhance as a supplement. But I do think um, that the alpha brain helped. I do. But I can't, I can't tell you categorically because I was also – studying very hard and i wanted to get a good mark so maybe i was just very concentrated and i was interested in the subject because it you know is what i do every day um but i do feel there's a lot to it but the, the powder lion's mane you know if you want to grow your nerves because you've got a uh, nerve growth factor in it it's a mushroom derivative isn't it um you're better almost feels answer you know you're better going to fatty meats and and giving your body the nutrients it needs to build nerves. So I don't think you need that supplement. I think you just need to get your, um, you know, your diet on point. But I'll let you go, Jonathan, because it's your thing, isn't it? You were in that shop for a long time. Yeah, I was in that shop for a long time, selling a, selling a lot of crap that people didn't need. <laughs> I always feel guilty for it, but at the same time, I think, well, most people are vegan. They're promoting the wrong lifestyle. And they're kind of doomed themselves. And they're probably poor for it now. And maybe they're going to be a bit more sensible and spend more money on meat rather than crap. Um, anyway, 
out of that sort of rant. Um, Lions main was not a particularly effective or well, well, well often frequently bought product. Um, there was issues with a lot of the sourcing from it. Um, even the ones which were like, oh, organically grown, sourced from specialist place. A lot it, it is so hit and miss. You you can flip a coin and say if it's going to work for someone or not. Um, I have more experience with people finding success from things like choline, but so choline by tartrate. So that's in eggs and things like that. Um, unless you're eating quite a bit of eggs, in my opinion, you're probably not getting that much. How much you need very individually genetically dependent. Um, people with autism will drain out these things like mad. So I've noticed with myself, I've used these sort of things, and I do get a substantial benefit for taking them versus not. Then again, if I was eating lots of eggs, no, I don't notice a substantial benefit. Um, I'm more in line with the idea of using different amino acids. So one of them would be L-tyrosine. Um, helps produce thyroid hormones. It's a almost like a resource to help create um, triiodothyronine. Um, that seems to improve cognitive health. Um, also getting enough iron in your diet, so through beef, um, beef liver as well, things like that. Just I any mean, meat pretty much have lots of iron in it. That seems to be really useful for cognitive health. Um, there's a few more, let me think. Um, if you're neurodiverse, carnitine's important. Um, Omega-3 as well is very important. I'd probably use those over it. Um, but for most people, if you're eating eggs, good quality, high-fat salmon, fatty beef, fatty lamb, you're pretty much there. But um, if you're not there, supplements are much, much, much more useful. Um, but they're the ones I would use. So you're looking at um, tyrosine was one of them, uh, choline, butartrate, and iron. Um, they're the things as well which you can kind of underpin that people tend to be a bit poor absorbing due to different levels that you might find in the blood there. Not always, but they're things that can be quite often low in the body. Um, in terms of people that I've met, they've used it, not used it, had a blood test and seen some improvement. So it depends where you're coming from as well. You know, some of these things, like if you've got a completely nutrient-dense diet, then a lot of these things aren't going to be that useful. Uh, if you've got leaky gut, those things are much more useful. Um, so that as long as they're real foods, real amino acids, real vitamins, real, you know, not filled with crap, basically. Um, does anyone else have any takes on powdered lines, main things like that? Not, not really. I haven't um, tried lion's mane. Um, well, I have before I thought it was a neurotropic or even knew the expression, but um, didn't notice much. I do notice um, a bit of an effect from methylene blue, which I once in a blue moon. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even mean to say that. So, yeah, it's 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 good. And that seems to work. But I think the best thing, my my favourite new, newotropic is is fish. <laughs> I think you know, upping the 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 omega threes sometimes by adding some sardines or especially oysters, you know, because you got your kind of raw nose to tail thing there, and that can be really useful. I think it's not an old wives' tale that the fish is a brain food. So, you know, again, although mushrooms are not particularly a, a plant medicine, but they're not a carnivore thing. So, I would say the old thing of you know the fewer plants you eat, the fewer plant medicines you need to counteract the effects of the plants you've already eaten, and you can step aside from nature's polypharmacy. Yeah, that's a good point about about the the trace minerals and fish. They collate heavy metals that you'd otherwise be taking for your diet anyway so that that's actually another added benefit of the oily fish i think you know you think selenium things like that um there's loads of little trace minerals that do different antioxidant things astaxanthin um so blah, antioxidant things like that so i think there's more to it than you know just fatty meat if someone's been poisoned as like hell got loads of lithium i don't know what well, the other ones mercury maybe aluminium in their body then yeah collating those things out your body with heavy um heavy fatty fish is going to be a good good idea i think that's pretty much it for right. tonight guys i think we wrap it up there can i do just yeah, a stuff. really 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 quick one on um somebody's asking here do you drink um a ton of water all day mark mark s uh no absolutely not the higher fat you you have the more the body can produce its own um, deuterium-depleted water within the cell. 
and so you can kind of hydrate off good animal fats um you don't need to drink a load of water that's another load of nonsense we've been told it can strip out electrolytes it can strip out minerals it can strip it can fill you full of deuterium depending on what water you're drinking and of course all the crap that comes out of the tap water if you're drinking that so no just according like exactly that's what Stephen said here in the comments um drink to thirst only you know eat when you're hungry stop when you're full drink when you're thirsty stop when you're no, no longer thirsty your body tells you it's quite it's quite intelligent our body <laughs> let's let's just quickly go around just this last little piece just to say how much water roughly we drink each day so how much fluid we take in whether it be cream raw milk whatever um i drink between two and two and a half liters i'm close to two and a half because i'm losing body fat and i'm eating barely anything um what about you lee how much do you drink if and when i'm on raw milk which is only for like you know, strat strategic kind of approaches to things gaining weight or you know i'm priming at the moment for surgery but it won't i won't be on it long i drink absolutely no water whatsoever um if i eat a day of raw which i do occasionally i do eat raw um much less water maybe 250 milliliters but on average if i salt my food to taste and i cook it one or two meals um, i would say close to 750 milliliters of water with um celtic sea salt and i have just for the very first time on carnivore started to use a little bit of citrate magnesium citrate malate potassium um citrate as well and taurine so i've just started to supplement for the first time on carnivore um so that's what i'm also adding to my water but i only drink around 750 milliliters what about you phil how much roughly do you drink a day um it, it depends if I do some working out and it depends how how salty my food's been. I tend to get quite thirsty about an hour after eating, but I would say no, never more than two liters, sometimes only one. Uh, yeah, it sounds about right so far because based on our body weights, we're all different sizes. So yeah. What about you, Stephen? Um, I, I don't measure it. I've got no idea. No, no one asked really. you. Have any guess? Have a guess. The question was <laughs> roughly how much you drink each day. Four cups, less than a liter. liter. Less than a liter. Less than a liter. Yeah, yeah, me too. There we go. So we so none of us are dehydrated, and we all drink two liters or less of water a day. There we go. For the most part. So there we go. We don't need to drink six, ten liters of water. We're not dehydrated. We don't need more salt and more water because we're on a ketogenic style diet. So. Yeah, there we have it. Gallon, I think it would be genuinely electrolytes. It's not your body's going. I need more water, but it's really what you what you really need is more electrolytes. Maybe touring will help with that as well. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thanks for much for joining tonight, guys. Um, session number twenty two of Carn Carnival Team GB with myself. Get rid of this thing from the screen so you can see. Um, at Carnival Muscle, it's my YouTube channel. At Kent Carnival is Lee. Coach Stephen from Coach Stephen Thomas BSC, I think, or Coach Stephen, and Phil Escott from the Big Fat Challenge. See you next time, guys.